there are many other plots that can be used to study tails and to understand whether or not we are dealing with a phenomenon with data that might show a fat tail. Now, we will not consider them into detail, so I just want to cite two different graphical tools that could be used. But if you are interested, I refer you to the additional readings about this type of things. The first plot is in the family of moment ratio plots. Now, in a moment ratio plot, typically what you do is to try to characterize distributions by looking at the joint behavior of some of the moments of a distribution. A very useful plot is the plot that looks at the behavior of the coefficient of variation, which is nothing more than the ratio of the standard deviation over the mean, against the skewness. So on the x-axis, you put the coefficient of variation, on the y-axis, you put the skewness. Now, what you can uh, find out is that uh, essentially all theoretical distributions can be uh, mapped in this plot looking at the behavior of their theoretical coefficient of variation and their theoretical skewness. In reality you can even split the plot in two areas as you can see on your screen and then what you can do is just to compute the empirical coefficient of variation and the empirical skewness plot that point in the plot that you see on your screen and like for example the, more, the small square, the small triangle, you are able to find out in which of the areas your data uh, fall. If your data fall into the so-called Paratian area, it means that there are good signs that fat tails are present in the data. The, the same if your uh, point your empirical combination of coefficient of variation and skewness falls in the log normal area. Or if you consider a normally distributed random variable, the normally distributed random variable will always fall in the horizontal line that you see at the bottom of the, of the plot. Again, if you want to have more details about this plot, I refer you to the extra read. One thing that you have to notice in this plot is that this type of plot is extremely powerful and quite precise, so it can be really helpful in studying data, but the fact that we are requiring the skewness to be defined, it means that we cannot, for example, model a fat tail with an alpha that is smaller than 3. So we are requiring at least the skewness to be Finite. So this is something that you always have to take into consideration. And since we are requiring the skewness to be finite, then obviously also the variance and the mean will be finite, and this is totally okay for the coefficient of variation. But it's always nice to underline this, because it would make no sense to use this plot if you suspect that, for example, your data are so risky not to have the variance, because obviously this plot would make no sense. Another plot that can be used is the Zenga plot. Zenga is the name of the scholar that introduced the so-called Zenga curve. The Zenga curve in inequality studies is a transformation of the Lorentz curve. Differently from the Lorentz curve that is always convex, non-decreasing in the small uh, triangle and blah, 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 for what concerns the Zenga curve, the shape of the Zenga curve can be used to characterize a distribution. So while just looking at the shape in a graph of the Lorentz curve, you cannot recognize the distribution and you need the analytical form of the Lorentz curve in order to characterize a distribution, for the Zenga curve you have that different distributions show a different behavior in the Zenga plot. In the Zenga plot what you have you have the probability or the percentiles on the x-axis and the Zenga curve on the y-axis. And as you can see on your screen, the log normal, the exponential, and the Pareto have all different behaviors. For example, the log normal in the Zenga curve has a horizontal 
behavior. Uh, these are things that can be used and obviously the more you enter into the modeling of this type of things, uh, the better because you can be more precise. But again, also for the Zenka curves, I just refer you to the X-ray readings. After the diagnostic part that we have considered when dealing with all the different plots, you understand that a very important next step is the estimation of the parameters of either the generalized extreme value distribution or the generalized Pareto distribution. Now, for estimating the parameters of both distributions, there are different uh, approaches. Now, for sure, one can try to rely on maximum likelihood that we know is a common way of estimating the parameters of a distribution in statistics. Another approach which is uh, quite used in the field of extreme value theory is the so-called probability weighted moments approach. Now, there is a difference in the two approaches. We will not enter into the details. If you are interested, you find a lot of resources on that. But let's say that while the maximum likelihood approach is more canonical and well known, for what concerns the probability weighted moment approach, it's more uh, like, uh, I don't know how to do, how can we define that? It's, it's more a um, practical approach without a solid, at least for the moment, theoretical background. So, uh, in a sense, if you can choose between the two approaches, my suggestion is to stick with maximum likelihood. But there are situations in which maximum likelihood can be proven not to be reliable, and in that situation, then the probability weighted moments approach is definitely the best solution. When using maximum likelihood, the closed form analytical solution for the GEV is not available, in particular when you rely on the three parameters. GEV and numerical methods are obviously necessary. This is not a big deal because in all the packages you may want to use uh, to estimate the parameters of a GEV, you have already find all the implementations and nevertheless writing your own code in this situation is again quite simple. So if you like to write your own code for sure it is not a very big problem to write the MLE code for the generalize extreme value distribution that you can solve numerically. So it's just a matter of writing down the likelihood and maximize that. The maximum likelihood estimation is totally okay and possibly the best way to estimate the parameters of your GEV when the Xi parameter is larger than minus one half. Because it can be proven that in the opposite situation when Xi is smaller than uh, equal to minus one half, then the MLE loses consistency. So in those situations, it is better to use other approaches like the probability weighted moments. Now, for sure, you are very lucky if your data exactly follow a GV. So in that situation, you have that the Frechet, the Gamble, the Weibull uh, appear, so it's not a big deal. You have that the entire distribution can be easily estimated, but we know that, unfortunately, this is not the case in most applications. In most applications, you just focus on the maxima, and then you know that the partial maxima, properly rescaled, will follow a GV. So it means that in most applications, in reality, when you discuss about the estimation of the parameters of the GV, you are always thinking about the tail and just the tail of the distribution. So the big problem is to understand what the tail is. So where does the tail start? The estimation of the Xi parameter can be performed just looking at a certain number of upper order statistics. So let's say the top K order statistics. So we will consider the maximum, the second maximum, the third maximum, until we reach the kth, the kth maximum. Now the problem there is to decide what's the value of k. Now there are two things that are important in order to understand what is the proper k. 
From one side, we have to consider a sufficient number of other statistics. So just looking at three points is not enough to extrapolate reliable information. At the same time, what we know is that unless our data really follow completely a GV or a GPD, the theorems we have considered, so the Fischer-Tippett and the pickens balkman behan gives us condition for the tail. So we cannot enter too much into the bulk of the distribution. So while we need a certain number of order statistics, we don't need too many order statistics. So we want to stay in the tail. When playing with both the GEV and the GPD, a very important tool that we can use to have a grasp of the tail. So in order to understand, for example, what is the key, what is the threshold that tells us how many other statistics we are considering. And at the same time, uh, is a tool that gives us an educated guess about the value of the parameter Xi is the so-called heel plot which is based on the heel estimator of the tail parameter Xi. The heel estimator is particularly useful for fat tails, so for tails that are regularly varying. In those situations, the heel estimator is defined, as you see on your screen, using the order statistics. On the basis of the heel estimator, you can build a heel plot, which is an extremely useful plot for both deciding the optimal case, so the number of other statistics you will consider to define your tail, and also have an educated guess about the Xi parameter, or if you want, one over Xi, that is to say the alpha parameter. So how do you do that? You take your observation and you order the observations in decreasing order, so from the biggest to the smallest. For each observation, that you treat as a threshold, as we did for the mean excess function plot or the concentration profile, but now remember that the observations are not in increasing order, but in decreasing order, what you do is to compute the corresponding Hill estimator. So you start from the first observation, you compute the Hill estimator, then you consider the, the first and the second top observations, and you compute the Hill estimator, and so on. The optimal k is obtained when the heel plot stabilizes. So when you see that the value of the Xi parameter or the alpha parameter becomes more or less stable and stay there for a certain amount of thresholds, then it can keep on moving. But you want to stop as soon as you see a first uh, st stabilization in the plot. As soon as you see some stable behavior in the plot, what you have is that the corresponding Xi or the corresponding alpha will be your educated guess about Xi and alpha, and obviously you then continue with your analysis. And for what concerns the optimal K, you will choose the threshold which is corresponding to where the stable behavior of the plot starts. So a typical hill plot is the one that you see on your screen. Well, what you see is that we have this behavior of our estimator, but at a certain point we observe some stabilization of the value that I have underlined with a green rectangle. Okay, this is what we can consider the first really stable area. It means that our educated guess about the Xi parameter is the one corresponding to the area, and for what concerns the K, we can look down if we want to know how many observations we have to consider in the tail, or we look up and find the value of the threshold. Since later in our R application we will see again all the other plots, the me plot, the ZIF plot, but also the heel plot and the interpretation of the heel plot, I refer to that part of the lesson for more details. Okay, so now what I want to tell you is that the heel plot is extremely useful, it is a nice plot both to identify the possible threshold that tells us how many observations will constitute our tail for our analysis and at the same time it gives us an educated guess about the tail parameter alpha or xi depending on how you want to parameterize your tail behavior. If some general requirements are met, and typically they are met if you are considering a GEV with a xi that is positive, the heel estimator is 
uh, essentially the maximum likelihood estimator. You can show that they coincide. You know that the Heal estimator is consistent, it is asymptotically normal, so a lot of wonderful properties. So that's why it's a useful tool for the analysis of the tail. As I told you at the very beginning of our lessons on EVT, what we are doing here is just a quick overview of the most important tools that can be used. And later we will combine these tools with time series and other things we will discuss together to try to model market risk, credit risk, operational risk. So we are just considering the basic machinery we need. If you want to go deeper, obviously you have a lot of things you can study and focus on, but this is not the purpose of our course. So you can imagine that there are many other approaches that you can use to estimate the tail parameter, to try to understand how the tail is defined. So there are many things that you can do. The only uh, suggestion I can give you, because it's a common error, is not to use OLS starting from the ZIF plot. In fact, unfortunately, many scholars do the following. They plot the ZIF plot. Most of the time, they just stop at the ZIF plot without checking other things. And we know that the ZIF plot can be possibly misleading. For example, in the case of a logonormal distribution, when we don't have enough observations. And they just estimate the slope of the, of the plot using OLS. Now, it can be shown that what you get is essentially rubbish, so don't do that. On the opposite situation, we have the Decker's einmal de Haan estimator, which is an excellent estimator for the Xi parameter, uh, but uh, dealing with that estimator would need introducing a little bit more subtle things, so for me it is just sufficient to tell you that it exists. What we have said for the GV essentially holds for the GPD, so we can also use maximum likelihood. Obviously, the likelihood will be different. We can use uh, these methods. We also have other methods that are more specific, for example, to the peaks of a threshold approach. But we will consider all those methods later in real applications, so I don't want to overdo by giving too many theoretical details. If you are interested, you know the references, so you find a lot of material uh, there. And if you are uh, at the university, you can also attend specific courses on extreme value theory. So you have plenty of resources. Now, uh, what is important to stress is that once we have the Xi parameter, once we have estimated the Xi parameter, it, this is only for us, for us risk managers, the start the starting point of our journey. We don't stop with the estimation of Xi, but once we have Xi, we can use Xi, for example, to compute a more reliable valet risk, a more reliable expected shortfall with respect to those that we could just compute empirically looking at the data. In fact, thanks to extreme value theory and thanks to the strong results like the fischer tipper theorem of the pickens balkman de Haan, we know more about the structure of the tail and we can use that information to compensate for the lack of observations because you can imagine that in your data set very very large observations will be rare will be not very common so you may end up with just a little number of observations and as I will show you soon in an application sometimes relying on the empirical quantiles for the valid risk and the corresponding uh, means so the excess means for what concerns the expected shortfall can be highly misleading in the fact that you tend to underestimate the risk the tail risk of your loss distribution or whatever type of thing you are uh, studying. So we will see in applications how we can exploit the Xi parameter to have a better estimation of the full tail and the related quantity. So the valid risk, the expected shortfall, and so on.